Chapter One of Philosophical Essays by Bertrand Russell. Second half. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Landon D. C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. The Elements of Ethics. Part Four: Determinism and Morals. Section 24. The importance to ethics of the free will question is a subject upon which there has existed almost as much diversity of opinion as on the free will question itself. It has been urged by advocates of free will that its denial involves the denial of merit and demerit, and that with the denial of these, ethics collapses. It has been urged on the other side that unless we can foresee, at least partially, the consequences of our actions, it is impossible to know what course we ought to take under any given circumstances, and that if other people's actions cannot be in any degree predicted, the foresight required for rational action becomes impossible. I do not propose in the following discussion to go into the free will controversy itself, the grounds in favor of determinism appear to me overwhelming, and I shall content myself with a brief indication of these grounds. The question I am concerned with is not the free will question itself, but the question how, if at all, morals are affected by assuming determinism. In considering this question, as in most of the other problems of ethics, the moralist who has not had a philosophical training appears to me to go astray, and become involved in needless complications, through supposing that right and wrong in conduct are the ultimate conceptions of ethics, rather than good and bad, in the effects of conduct and in other things. The words good and bad are used both for the sort of conduct which is right or wrong, and for the sort of effects to be expected from right and wrong conduct, respectively. We speak of a good picture, a good dinner, and so on, as well as of a good action. But there is a great difference between these two meanings of good. Roughly speaking, a good action is one of which the probable effects are good in the other sense. It is confusing to have two meanings for one word, and we therefore agreed in the previous section to speak of right action rather than a good action. In order to decide whether an action is right, it is necessary, as we have seen, to consider its probable effects. If the probable effects are, on the whole, better than those of any other action which is possible, under the circumstances, then the action is right. The things that are good are things which, on their own account, and apart from any consideration of their effects, we ought to wish to see in existence. They are such things as, we may suppose, might make the world appear to the Creator worth creating. I do not wish to deny that right conduct is among the things that are good on their own account, but if it is so, it depends for its intrinsic goodness upon the goodness of those other things which it aims at producing, such as love or happiness. Thus the rightness of conduct is not the fundamental conception upon which ethics is built up. This fundamental conception is intrinsic goodness, or badness. As the outcome of our discussions in the previous section, I shall assume the following definitions. The objectively right action, in any circumstances, is that action which, of all that are possible, gives us, when account is taken of all available data, the greatest expectation of probable good effects, or the least expectation of probable bad effects. The subjectively right, or moral action, is that one which will be judged by the agent to be objectively right, 
if he devotes to the question an appropriate amount of candid thought or in the case of actions that ought to be impulsive a small amount the appropriate amount of thought depends upon the importance of the action and the difficulty of the decision an act is neither moral nor immoral when it is unimportant and a small amount of reflection would not suffice to show whether it was right or wrong after these preliminaries we can pass to the consideration of our main topic section twenty five the principle of causality that every event is determined by previous events and can theoretically be predicted when enough previous events are known appears to apply just as much to human actions as to other events it cannot be said that its application to human actions or to any other phenomena is wholly beyond doubt but a doubt extending to the principle of causality must be so fundamental as to involve all science all everyday knowledge and everything or almost everything that we believe about the actual world if causality is doubted morals collapse since a right action as we have seen is one of which the probable effects are the best possible so that estimates of right and wrong necessarily presuppose that our actions can have effects and therefore that the law of causality holds in favor of the view that human actions alone are not the effects of causes there appears to be no ground whatever except the sense of spontaneity but the sense of spontaneity only affirms that we can do as we choose and choose as we please which no determinist denies it cannot affirm that our choice is independent of all motives footnote one a motive means merely a cause of volition end of footnote one and indeed introspection tends rather to show the opposite it is said by the advocates of free will footnote two i use free will to mean the doctrine that not all volitions are determined by causes which is the denial of determinism free will is often used in senses compatible with determinism but i am not concerned to affirm it or deny it in such senses End of footnote two. that determinism destroys morals since it shows that all our actions are inevitable and that therefore they deserve neither praise nor blame let us consider how far if at all this is the case section twenty six the part of ethics which is concerned not with conduct but with the meaning of good and bad and the things that are intrinsically good and bad is plainly quite independent of free will causality belongs to the description of the existing world and we saw that no inference can be drawn from what exists to what is good whether then causality holds always sometimes or never is a question wholly irrelevant in the consideration of intrinsic goods and evils but when we come to conduct and the notion of ought we cannot be sure that determinism makes no difference for we saw that the objectively right action may be defined as that one which of all that are possible under the circumstances will probably on the whole have the best consequences the action which is objectively right must therefore be in some sense possible but if determinism is true there is a sense in which no action is possible except the one actually performed hence if the two senses of possibility are the same the action actually performed is always objectively right for it is the only possible action and therefore there is no other possible action which would have had better results there is here i think a real difficulty 
but let us consider the various kinds of possibility which may be meant. In order that an act may be a possible act, it must be physically possible to perform, it must be possible to think of, and it must be possible to choose, if we think of it. Physical possibility, to begin with, is obviously necessary. There are circumstances under which I might do a great deal of good by running from Oxford to London in five minutes, but I should not be called unwise or guilty of an objectively wrong act for omitting to do so. We may define an act as physically possible when it will occur if I will it. Acts for which this condition fails are not to be taken account of in estimating rightness or wrongness. Section 27. To judge whether an act is possible, to think of, is more difficult, but we certainly take account of it in judging what a man ought to do. There is no physical impossibility about employing one's spare moments in writing lyric poems better than any yet written, and this would certainly be a more useful employment than most people find for their spare moments. But we do not blame people for not writing lyric poems unless, like Fitzgerald, they are people that we feel could have written them. And not only do we not blame them, but we feel that their action may be objectively as well as subjectively right if it is the wisest that they could have thought of. But what they could have thought of is not the same as what they did think of. Suppose a man in a fire or a shipwreck becomes so panic-stricken that he never for a moment thinks of the help that is due to other people. We do not on that account hold that he does right in only thinking of himself. Hence, in some sense, though it is not quite clear what this sense is, some of the courses of action which a man does not think of are regarded as possible for him to think of, though others are admittedly impossible. There is thus a sense in which it must be possible to think of an action, if we are to hold that it is objectively wrong not to perform the action. There is also, if determinism is true, a sense in which it is not possible to think of any action except those which we do think of. But it is questionable whether these two senses of possibility are the same. A man who finds that his house is on fire may run out of it in a panic without thinking of warning the other inmates. But we feel, rightly or wrongly, that it was possible for him to think of warning them, in a sense in which it is not possible for a prosaic person to think of a lyric poem. It may be that we are wrong in feeling this difference, and that what really distinguishes the two cases is dependence upon past decisions. That is to say, we may recognize that no different choice among alternatives thought of at any time would have turned an ordinary man into a good lyric poet, but that most men, by suitably choosing among alternatives actually thought of, can acquire the sort of character which will lead them to remember their neighbors in a fire. And if a man engages in some useful occupation of which a natural effect is to destroy his nerve, we may conceivably hold that this excuses his panic in an emergency. In such a point, it would seem that our judgment may really be dependent on the view we take as to the existence of free will. For the believer in free will cannot allow any such excuse. If we try to state the difference we feel between the case of the lyric poems and the case of the fire, it seems to come to this that we do not hold an act objectively wrong when it would have required that we recognize as a special aptitude in order to think of a better act, and when we believe that the agent did not possess 
this aptitude. But this distinction seems to imply that there is not such a thing as a special aptitude for this or that virtue, a view which cannot, I think, be maintained. An aptitude for generosity or for kindness may be as much a natural gift as an aptitude for poetry, and an aptitude for poetry may be as much improved by practice as an aptitude for kindness or generosity. Thus it would seem that there is no sense in which it is possible to think of some actions, which in fact we do not think of, but impossible to think of others, except the sense that the ones we regard as possible would have been thought of if a different choice among alternatives actually thought of had been made on some previous occasion. We shall then modify our previous definition of the objectively right action by saying that it is the probably most beneficial among those that occur to the agent at the moment of choice. But we shall hold that, in certain cases, the fact that a more beneficial alternative does not occur to him is evidence of a wrong choice on some previous occasion. Section 28. But, since occasions of choice do often arise, and since there certainly is a sense in which it is possible to choose any one of a number of different actions which we think of, we can still distinguish some actions as right and some as wrong. Our previous definitions of objectively right actions and of moral actions still hold with the modification that, among physically possible actions, only those which we actually think of are to be regarded as possible. When several alternative actions present themselves, it is certain that we can both do which we choose and choose which we will. In this sense, all the alternatives are possible. What determinism maintains is that our will to choose this or that alternative is the effect of antecedents. But this does not prevent our will from being itself a cause of other effects. And the sense in which different decisions are possible seems sufficient to distinguish some actions as right and some as wrong, some as moral and some as immoral. Connected with this, is another sense in which, when we deliberate, either decision is possible. The fact that we judge one course objectively right may be the cause of our choosing this course. Thus, before we have decided as to which course we think right, either is possible in the sense that either will result from our decision as to which we think right. This sense of possibility is important to the moralist and illustrates the fact that determinism does not make moral deliberation futile. Section 29. Determinism does not, therefore, destroy the distinction of right and wrong, and we saw before that it does not destroy the distinction of good or bad. We shall still be able to regard some people as better than others and some actions as more right than others. But it is said that praise and blame and responsibility are destroyed by determinism. When a madman commits what in a sane man we should call a crime, we do not blame him, partly because he probably cannot judge rightly as to consequences, but partly also because we feel that he could not have done otherwise. If all men are really in the position of the madman, it would seem that all ought to escape blame. But I think the question of choice really decides as to praise and blame. The madman, we believe, excluding the case of wrong judgment as to consequences, did not choose between different courses, but was impelled by a blind impulse. The sane man who, say, commits a murder, has, on the contrary, either at the time of the murder, or at some earlier time, 
chosen the worst of two or more alternatives that occurred to him. And it is for this we blame him. It is true that the two cases merge into each other, and the madman may be blamed, if he has become mad, in consequence of vicious self-indulgence. But it is right that the two cases should not be too sharply distinguished, for we know how hard it often is in practice to decide whether people are what is called responsible for their actions. It is sufficient that there is a distinction, and that it can be applied easily in most cases, though there are marginal cases which present difficulties. We apply praise or blame, then, and we attribute responsibility, where a man, having to exercise choice, has chosen wrongly, and this sense of praise or blame is not destroyed by determinism. Section 30. Determinism, then, does not in any way interfere with morals. It is worth noticing that free will, on the contrary, would interfere most seriously if anybody really believed in it. People never do, as a matter of fact, believe that anyone else's actions are not determined by motives, however much they may think themselves free. Bradshaw consists entirely of predictions as to the actions of engine drivers, but no one doubts Bradshaw on the ground that the volitions of engine drivers are not governed by motives. If we really believed that other people's actions did not have causes, we could never try to influence other people's actions, for such influence can only result if we know, more or less, what causes will produce the actions we desire. If we could never try to influence other people's actions, no man could try to get elected to Parliament, or ask a woman to marry him. Argument, exhortation, and command would become mere idle breath. Thus, almost all the actions with which morality is concerned would become irrational. Rational action would be wholly precluded from trying to influence people's volitions, and right and wrong would be interfered with in a way in which determinism certainly does not interfere with them. Most morality absolutely depends upon the assumption that volitions have causes, and nothing in morals is destroyed by this assumption. Most people, it is true, do not hold the free will doctrine in so extreme a form as that against which we have been arguing. They would hold that most of a man's actions have causes, but that some few, say 1%, are uncaused, spontaneous assertions of will. If this view is taken, unless we can mark off the 1% of volitions which are uncaused, every inference as to human actions is infected with what we may call 1% of doubt. This, it must be admitted, would not matter much in practice, because, on other grounds, there will usually be at least 1% of doubt in predictions as to human actions. But from the standpoint of theory, there is a wide difference. The sort of doubt that must be admitted in any case is a sort which is capable of indefinite diminution, while the sort derived from the possible intervention of free will is absolute and ultimate. Insofar, therefore, as the possibility of uncaused volitions comes in, all the consequences above pointed out follow. And, in so far as it does not come in, determinism holds. Thus, 1% of free will has 1% of the objectionableness of absolute free will, and has also only 1% of the ethical consequences. In fact, however, no one really holds that right acts are uncaused. It would be a monstrous paradox to say that a man's decision ought not to be influenced by his belief as to what is his duty. Yet, if he allows himself to decide on an act because he believes it to be his duty, his decision has a motive, that is, a cause, and is not free in the only sense in which the determinist must deny freedom.
It would seem, therefore, that the objections to determinism are mainly attributable to misunderstanding of its purport. Hence, finally, it is not determinism, but free will, that has subversive consequences. There is, therefore, no reason to regret the grounds in favor of determinism are overwhelmingly strong. Part 5. Egoism Section 31. We have next to consider an objection to the view that objective rightness consists in probably having the best consequences on the whole. The objection I mean is that of egoism, that a man's first duty is to himself, and that to secure his own good is more imperative than to secure other people's. Extensions of this view are that a man should prefer the interest of his family to that of strangers, of his countrymen to that of foreigners, or of his friends to that of his enemies. All these views have in common the belief that, quite apart from practicability, the ends which one man ought to pursue are different from those which another man ought to pursue. Egoism has several different meanings. It may mean that every man is psychologically bound to pursue his own good exclusively. It may mean that every man will achieve the best result, on the whole, by pursuing his own good. It may mean that his own good is the only thing a man ought to think good. And it may mean, lastly, that there is no such thing as the general good at all, but only individual goods and that each man is only concerned with what is good for himself. These meanings all presuppose that we know what is meant by my good, but this is not an easy conception to define clearly. I shall therefore begin by considering what it is capable of meaning. Section 32. My good is a phrase capable of many different meanings. It may mean any good that I desire, whether this has any further special relation to me or not. Or again, it may mean my pleasure, or any state of mind in me which is good. Or it may include honor and respect from others, or anything which is good, and has some relation to me in virtue of which it can be considered mine. The two meanings with which we shall be concerned are 1. Any good I desire, 2. Any good having to me some relation other than that I desire it, which it does not have to others, of the kind which makes it mine, as my pleasure, my reputation, my learning, my virtue, and so on. The theory that every man is psychologically bound to pursue his own good exclusively is, I think, inconsistent with known facts of human nature, unless my good is taken in the sense of something which I desire, and even then I do not necessarily pursue what I desire most strongly. The important point is that what I desire has not necessarily any such other relation to me as would make it my good in the second of the above senses. This is the point which must now occupy us. If my good means a good which is mine in some other sense than that I desire it, then I think it can be shown that my good is by no means the only object of my actions. There is a common confusion in people's thoughts on this subject, namely the following. If I desire anything, its attainment will give me more or less pleasure, and its non-attainment will give me more or less pain. Hence it is inferred that I desire it on account of the pleasure it would give me, and not on its own account. But this is to put the cart before the horse, the pleasure we get from things usually depends upon our having had a desire, which they satisfy. The pleasure of eating and drinking, for example, depend upon hunger and thirst. Or, take again, the pleasure people get from the victory of their own party 
in a contest. Other people would derive just the same pleasure from the victory of the opposite party. In each case, the pleasure depends for its existence upon the desire, and would not exist if the desire had not existed. Thus, we cannot say that people only desire pleasure. They desire all kinds of things, and pleasure comes from desires much oftener than desires from imagined pleasures. Thus, the mere fact that a man will derive some pleasure from achieving his object is no reason for saying that his desire is self-centered. Section 33. Such arguments are necessary for the refutation of those who hold it to be obvious a priori that every man must always pursue his own good exclusively. But, as is often the case with refutations of a priori theories, there is an air of logic chopping about a discussion as to whether desire or the pleasure expected from its satisfaction ought to have priority. Let us leave these questions and consider whether, as a matter of fact, people's actions can be explained on the egoistic hypotheses. The most obvious instances to the contrary are, of course, cases of self-sacrifice, of men to their country, for example, or of parents to children. But these instances are so obvious that the egoistic theory is ready with an answer. It will maintain that, in such cases, the people who make the sacrifice would not be happy if they did not make it, that they desire the applause of men or of their own consciences, that they find in the moment of sacrifice an exaltation which realizes their highest self, and so on and so on and so on. Let us examine these arguments. It is said that the people in question would not be happy if they did not make the sacrifice. This is often false, in fact, but we may let that pass. Why would they not be happy? Either because others would think less well of them, or because they themselves would feel pangs of conscience, or because they genuinely desired the object to be attained by their sacrifice, and could not be happy without it. In the last case, they have admittedly a desire not centered in self. The supposed effect upon their happiness is due to the desire, and would not otherwise exist, so that the effect upon happiness cannot be brought into account for the desire. But if people may have desires for things that lie outside their ego, then such desires, like others, may determine action, and it is possible to pursue an object which is not my good in any sense except that I desire and pursue it. Thus, in all cases of self-sacrifice, those who hold the egoistic theory will have to maintain that the outside end, secured by the self-sacrifice, is not desired. When a soldier sacrifices his life, he does not desire the victory of his country, and so on. This is already sufficiently preposterous and sufficiently contrary to plain fact. But it is not enough. Assuming that this is the case, let us suppose that self-sacrifice is dictated, not by a desire for any outside end, but by fear of the disapproval of others. If this were so, there would be no self-sacrifice if no one would know of its non-performance. A man who saw another drowning would not try to save him if he was sure that no one would see him not jumping into the water. This also is plainly contrary to fact. It may be said that the desire for approval, as well as the fear of disapproval, ought to be taken into account, and a man can always make sure of approval by judicious boasting, but men have made sacrifices universally disapproved, for example, in maintaining unpopular opinions, and very many have made sacrifices of which an essential part was that they should not be mentioned. Hence, the defender of psychological egoism is driven back on the approval of conscience as the motive to an act of self-sacrifice. But it is really impossible to believe that all who deny themselves are so destitute of rational foresight, as this theory implies, 
The pangs of conscience are, to most people, a very endurable pain, and practice in wrongdoing rapidly diminishes them. And if the act of self-denial involves the loss of life, the rapture of self-approbation, which the virtuous man is supposed to be seeking, must in any case be very brief. I conclude that the psychology of egoism is only produced by the exigencies of a wrong theory and is not in accordance with the facts of observable human nature. Thus, when we consider human actions and desires apart from preconceived theories, it is obvious that most of them are objective and have no direct reference to self. If my good means an object belonging to me in the sense of being a state of my mind, or a whole of which a state of my mind is a part, or what others think about me, then it is false that I can only desire or pursue my good. The only sense in which it is true is when my good is taken to mean what I desire. But what I desire need not have any other connection with myself except that I desire it. Thus, there is no truth in the doctrine that men do, as a matter of fact, only desire or pursue objects specially related to themselves in any way except as objects desired or pursued. Section 34. The next form of egoism to be considered is the doctrine that every man will best serve the general good by pursuing his own. There is a comfortable 18th century flavor about this doctrine. It suggests a good income, a good digestion, and an enviable limitation of sympathy. We may admit at once that in a well-ordered world it would be true, and even that as society becomes better organized it becomes progressively truer, since rewards will more and more be attached to useful actions. And in so far as a man's own good is more in his control than other people's, his actions will rightly concern themselves more with it than with other people's. For the same reason, he will be more concerned with the good of his family than with that of people with whom he has less to do, and more with the good of his country than with that of foreign countries. But the scope of such considerations is strictly limited, and every one can easily find in his own experience cases where the general good has been served by what, at any rate, appears to be a self-sacrifice. If such cases are to be explained away, it is necessary to alter the conception of my own good in a way which destroys the significance of the doctrine we are considering. It may be said, for example, that the greatest of goods is a virtuous life. It will then follow that whoever lives a virtuous life secures for himself the greatest of goods. But if the doctrine means to assert, as it usually does, that self-centered desires, if they are prudent and enlightened, will suffice to produce the most useful conduct, then a refutation may be obtained, either from common experience or from any shining example of public merit. The reformer is almost always a man who has strong desires for objects quite unconnected with himself, and indeed this is a characteristic of all who are not petty-minded. I think the doctrine depends for its plausibility, like psychological egoism, upon regarding every object which I desire as my good, and supposing that it must be mine in some sense other than that I desire it. Section 35. The doctrine that my good is the only thing that I ought to think good can only be logically maintained by those who hold that I ought to believe what is false. For if I am right in thinking that my good is the only good, then everyone else is mistaken unless he admits that my good, not his, is the only good. But this is an admission which I can scarcely hope 
that others will be willing to make. But what is really intended is, as a rule, to deny that there is any such thing as the general good at all. This doctrine cannot be logically refuted, unless by discovering in those who maintain it some opinion which implies the opposite. If a man were to maintain that there is no such thing as color, for example, we should be unable to disprove his position, provided he was careful to think out its implications. As a matter of fact, however, everybody does hold opinions which imply a general good. Everybody judges that some sorts of communities are better than others, and most people who affirm that when they say a thing is good, they mean merely that they desire it, would admit that it is better two people's desires should be satisfied than only one person's. In some such way, people fail to carry out the doctrine that there is no such concept as good. And if there is such a concept, then what is good is not good for me or for you, but is simply good. The denial that there is such a thing as good, in an impersonal sense, is only possible, therefore, to those who are content to have no ethics at all. Section 36. It is possible to hold that, although there is such a thing as the general good, and although this is not always best served by pursuing my own good, yet it is always right to pursue my own good exclusively. This doctrine is not now often held as regards individuals, but in international politics it is commonly held as regards nations. Many Englishmen and many Germans would admit that it is right for an English statesman to pursue exclusively the good of England and a German the good of Germany, even if that good is to be attained by greater injury to the other. It is difficult to see what grounds there can be for such a view. If good is to be pursued at all, it can hardly be relevant who is going to enjoy the good. It would be as reasonable for a man on Sundays to think only of his welfare on future Sundays, and on Mondays to think only of Mondays. The doctrine, in fact, seems to have no merit, except that it justifies acts otherwise unjustifiable. It is indeed so evident that it is better to secure a greater good for A than a lesser good for B, that it is hard to find any still more evident principle by which to prove this. And if A happens to be someone else, and B to be myself, that cannot affect the question, since it is irrelevant to the general maxim who A and B may be. If no form of egoism is valid, it follows that an act which ought to be performed may involve a self-sacrifice not compensated by any personal good acquired by means of such an act. So unwilling, however, are people to admit self-sacrifice as an ultimate duty that they will often defend theological dogmas on the ground that such dogmas reconcile self-interest with duty. Such reconciliations, it should be observed, are in any case merely external. They do not show that duty means the pursuit of one's own interest, but only that the acts which it dictates are those that further one's own interest. Thus, when it is pretended that there are logical grounds making such reconciliations imperative, we must reply that the logical purpose aimed at could only be secured by showing that duty means the same as self-interest. It is sometimes said that the two maxims, you ought to aim at producing the greatest good and you ought to pursue your own interest, are equally evident, and each is supposed to be true in all possible circumstances and in all possible worlds. But if that were the case, a world where self-interest and the general good might conflict ought not only to be non-existent, but inconceivable. 
Yet so far is it from being inconceivable that many people conceive it to be exemplified in the actual world. Hence the view that honesty is the best policy may be a comfort to the reluctant saint, but cannot be a solution to the perplexed logician. The notion, therefore, that a good God or a future life can be logically inferred to remove the apparent conflict of self-interest and the general good is quite unwarrantable. If there were a logical puzzle, it could only be removed by showing that self-interest and the general good mean the same thing, not by showing that they coincide in fact. But if the above discussion has been sound, there is no logical puzzle we ought to pursue the general good, and when this conflicts with self-interest, self-interest ought to give way. Part 6. Methods of Estimating Goods and Evils Section 37. In order to complete our account of ethics, it would be natural to give a list of the principal goods and evils of which we have experience. I shall, however, not attempt to give such a list, since I hold that the reader is probably quite as capable, as I am, of judging what things are good and what bad. All that I propose to do in this section is to examine the view that we can never know what is good and what bad, and to suggest methods to be employed and fallacies to be avoided in considering intrinsic goodness or badness. There is a widespread ethical skepticism, which is based upon observations of men's differences in regard to ethical questions. It is said that A thinks one thing good, and B thinks another, and there is no possible way in which either can persuade the other that he is wrong. Hence it is concluded, the whole thing is really only a matter of taste, and it is a waste of time to ask which is right when two people differ in a judgment of value. It would be absurd to deny that as compared with physical science, ethics does suffer from a measure of the defect which such skeptics allege. It must be admitted that ultimately the judgment, this thing is good or that thing is bad, must be an immediate judgment which results merely from considering the thing appraised, and cannot be proved by any argument that would appeal to a man who had passed an opposite immediate judgment. I think it must also be admitted that, even after every possible precaution against error has been taken, people's immediate judgments of value do still differ more or less. But such immediate differences seem to me to be the exception, most of the actual differences are of a kind which argument might lessen, since usually the opinion held is either one of which the opposite is demonstrable, or one which is falsely believed to be itself demonstrable. This second alternative embraces all false beliefs held because they flow from a false theory, and such beliefs though often the direct contraries of what immediate inspection would lead to, are apt to be a complete bar to inspection. This is a very familiar phenomenon. Sidney Smith, believed to be always witty, says, Pass the mustard, and the whole table is convulsed with laughter. Much wrong judgment in ethics is of this nature. Section 38 in regard to the things that are good or bad in themselves, and not merely on account of their effects, there are two opposite errors of this sort to be avoided, the one the error of the philosopher, the other that of the moralist. The philosopher, bent on the construction of a system, is inclined to simplify the facts unduly, to give them a symmetry which is fictitious, and to twist them into a form in which they can all be deduced from one or two general principles. The moralist, on the other hand, being primarily concerned with conduct, tends to become absorbed in means to value the actions men ought to perform more than the ends which such actions serve. 
this latter error, for in theorizing it is an error, is so forced upon us by the exigencies of practice that we may easily come to feel the ultimate ends of life far less important than the proximate and intermediate purposes which we consciously endeavor to realize. And hence, most of what they value in this world would have to be omitted by many moralists from any imagined heaven because there such things as self-denial and effort and courage and pity could find no place. The philosopher's error is less common than the moralist's because the love of system and of the intellectual satisfaction of a deductive edifice is rarer than the love of virtue. But among writers on ethics, the philosopher's error occurs oftener than the other because such writers are almost always among the few men who have the love of system. Kant has the bad eminence of combining both errors in the highest possible degree, since he holds that there is nothing good except the virtuous will, a view which simplifies the good as much as any philosopher could wish, and mistakes means for ends as completely as any moralist could enjoin. Section 39. The moralist's fallacy illustrates another important point. The immediate judgments which are required in ethics concern intrinsic goods and evils, not right and wrong conduct. I do not wish to deny that people have immediate judgments of right and wrong, nor yet that, in action, it is usually moral to follow such judgments. What I mean is that such judgments are not among those which ethics must accept without proof, provided that, whether by the suggestions of such judgments or otherwise, we have accepted some such general connection of right action with good consequences, as was advocated in Part 3. For then, if we know what is good and bad, we can discover what is right and wrong. Hence, in regard to right and wrong, it is unnecessary to rely upon immediate inspection, a method which must be allowed some scope, but should be allowed as little as possible. I think when attention is clearly confined to good and bad, as opposed to right and wrong, the amount of disagreement between different people is seen to be much less than might at first be thought. Right and wrong, since they depend upon consequences, will vary, as men's circumstances vary, and will be largely affected in particular by men's beliefs about right and wrong, since many acts will, in all likelihood, have a worse effect if they are generally believed to be wrong than if they are generally believed to be right. While with some acts, the opposite is the case. For example, a man who, in exceptional circumstances, acts contrary to a received and generally true moral rule is more likely to be right if he will be thought to be wrong, for then his action will have less tendency to weaken the authority of the rule. Thus, differences as regards rules of right action are not a ground for skepticism provided the different rules are held in different societies. Yet such differences are in practice a very powerful solvent of ethical beliefs. Section 40. Some differences as to what is good in itself must, however, be acknowledged even when all possible care has been taken to consider the question by itself. For example, retributive punishment as opposed to deterrent or reformative punishment, was almost universally considered good until a recent time. Yet in our own day, it is very generally condemned. Hell can only be justified if retributive punishment is good, and the decay of a belief in hell appears to be mainly due to a change of feeling on this point. But even when there seems to be a difference as to ends, this difference is often due to some theory on one side or on both, and not to immediate inspection. Thus, in the case of hell, people may reason 
consciously or unconsciously, that revelation shows that God created hell, and that, therefore, retributive punishment must be good. And this argument doubtless influences many who would otherwise hold retributive punishment to be bad. Where there is such an influence, we do not have a genuine difference in an immediate judgment as to intrinsic good or bad. And in fact, such differences are, I believe, very rare indeed. Section 41. A source of apparent differences is that some things which in isolation are bad or indifferent are essential ingredients in what is good as a whole, and some things which are good or indifferent are essential ingredients in what is bad as a whole. In such cases, we judge differently according as we are considering a thing in isolation or as an ingredient in some larger whole. To judge whether a thing is in itself good, we have to ask ourselves whether we should value it if it existed otherwise than as an ingredient in some whole which we value. But to judge whether a thing ought to exist, we have to consider whether it is a part of some whole which we value so much that we prefer the existence of the whole, with its possibly bad part, to the existence of neither. Thus, compassion is a good of which someone's misfortune is an essential part. Envy is an evil of which someone's good is an essential part. Hence, the position of some optimists that all the evil in the world is necessary to constitute the best possible whole is not logically absurd, though there is, so far as I know, no evidence in its favor. Similarly, the view that all the good is an unavoidable ingredient in the worst possible whole is not logically absurd, but this view, not being agreeable, has found no advocates. Even where none of the parts of a good whole are bad, or of a bad whole good, it often happens that the value of a complex whole cannot be measured by adding together the values of its parts. The whole is often better or worse than the sum of the values of its parts. In all aesthetic pleasures, for example, it is important that the object admired should really be beautiful. In the admiration of what is ugly, there is something ridiculous, or even sometimes repulsive, although apart from the object, there may be no difference in the value of the emotion per se. And yet, apart from the admiration it may produce, a beautiful object, if it is inanimate, appears to be neither good nor bad. Thus, in themselves, an ugly object, and the emotion it excites, in a person of bad taste, may be respectively just as good as a beautiful object and the emotion it excites in a person of good taste. Yet, we consider the enjoyment of what is beautiful to be better, as a whole, than an exactly similar enjoyment of what is ugly. If we did not, we should be foolish not to encourage bad taste, since ugly objects are much easier to produce than beautiful ones. In like manner, we consider it better to love a good person than a bad one. Titiana's love for Bottom may be as lyric as Juliet's for Romeo, yet Titiana is laughed at. Thus, many goods must be estimated as wholes, not piecemeal, and exactly the same applies to evils. In such cases, the wholes may be called organic unities. Section 42. Many theorists who have some simple account of the sole good have also, probably, without having recognized them as such, immediate judgments of value, inconsistent with their theory, from which it appears that their theory is not really derived from immediate judgments of value. Thus, those who have held that virtue is the sole good have generally also held that in heaven, it will be rewarded by happiness.
yet a reward must be a good. Thus they plainly feel that happiness also is a good. If virtue were the sole good, it would be logically compelled to be its own reward. A similar argument can be brought against those who hold that the sole good is pleasure, or happiness as some prefer to call it. This doctrine is regarded as self-evident by many, both philosophers and plain men. But although the general principle may at first sight seem obvious, many of its applications are highly paradoxical. To live in a fool's paradise is commonly considered a misfortune. Yet, in a world which allows no paradise of any other kind, a fool's paradise is surely the happiest habitation. All hedonists are at great pains to prove that what are called the higher pleasures are really the more pleasurable, but plainly their anxiety to prove this arises from an uneasy instinct that such pleasures are higher, even if they are not more pleasurable. The bias which appears in hedonist arguments on this point is otherwise quite inexplicable. Although they hold that, quantity of pleasure being equal, pushpin is as good as poetry, they are careful to argue that quantity of pleasure is not equal, but is greater in the case of poetry, a proposition which seems highly disputable and chiefly commended by its edifying nature. Any one would admit that the pleasure of poetry is a greater good than the pleasure of bathing on a hot day, but few people could say honestly that it is as intense, and even states of mind which, as a whole, are painful may be highly good. Love of the dead may easily be the best thing in a life, yet it cannot but be full of pain, and conversely, we condemn pleasure derived from the love of what is bad. Even if we admit that the pleasure in itself is a good, we consider the whole state of mind bad. If two bitter enemies lived in different countries, and each falsely believed that the other was undergoing tortures, each might feel pleasure. Yet we should not consider such a state of things good. We should even think it much worse than a state in which each derived pain from the belief that the other was in torture. It may, of course, be said that this is due to the fact that hatred in general causes more pain than pleasure, and hence is condemned broadly on hedonistic grounds without sufficient regard to possible exceptions. But the possibility of exceptions to the principle that hatred is bad can hardly be seriously maintained, except by a theorist in difficulties. Thus, while we may admit that all pleasure in itself is probably more or less good, we must hold that pleasures are not good in proportion to their intensity, and that many states of mind, although pleasure is an element in them, are bad as a whole, and may even be worse than they would be if the pleasure were absent. And this result has been reached by appealing to ethical judgments, with which almost everyone would agree. I conclude, therefore, from all that has been adduced in this section, that although some ultimate ethical differences must be admitted between different people, by far the greater part of the commonly observed differences are due either to asking the wrong question, as, for example, by mistaking means for ends, or to the influence of a hasty theory in falsifying immediate judgments. There is reason to hope, therefore, that a very large measure of agreement on ethical questions may be expected to result from clearer thinking, and this is probably the chief benefit to be ultimately derived from the study of ethics. Section 43. We may now sum up our whole discussion of ethics. The most fundamental notions in ethics, we agreed, are the notions of intrinsic good and evil, 
these are wholly independent of other notions. And the goodness or badness of a thing cannot be inferred from any of its other qualities, such as its existence or non-existence. Hence, what actually occurs has no bearing on what ought to occur, and what ought to occur has no bearing on what does occur. The next pair of notions with which we were concerned were those of objective right and wrong. The objectively right act is the act which a man will hold that he ought to perform when he is not mistaken. This, we decided, is that one of all the acts that are possible which will probably produce the best results. Thus, in judging what actions are right, we need to know what results are good. When a man is mistaken as to what is objectively right, he may nevertheless act in a way which is subjectively right. Thus, we need a new pair of notions, which we called moral and immoral. A moral act is virtuous and deserves praise. An immoral act is sinful and deserves blame. A moral act, we decided, is one which the agent would have judged right after an appropriate amount of candid reflection, footnote 1, or after a small amount in the cases of acts which ought to be impulsive, end of footnote 1, where the appropriate amount of reflection depends upon the difficulty and importance of his decision. We then considered the bearing of determinism on morals, which we found to consist in a limitation of the acts which are possible under any circumstances. If determinism is true, there is a sense in which no act is possible except the one which in fact occurs. But there is another sense, which is the one relevant to ethics, in which any act is possible which is contemplated during deliberation, provided it is physically possible, that is, will be performed if we will to perform it. We then discussed various forms of egoism, and decided that all of them are false. Finally, we considered some mistakes which are liable to be made in attempting to form an immediate judgment as to the goodness or badness of a thing, and we decided that, when these mistakes are avoided, people probably differ very little in their judgments of intrinsic value. The making of such judgments we did not undertake, for if the reader agrees, he could make them himself, and if he disagrees without falling into any of the possible confusions, there is no way of altering his opinion. End of chapter 1